Hey, Mittens. You want to say hello to everyone? No, you just want to give them your fanny. Hey, garden nerds. <laughs> Hey Garden Nerds, I'm Christy Wilhelmy from Garden Nerd. Today we have a special treat for you. We're going on a field trip. Uh, back in 2014, I met a man named Dr. Clive Siegel and he has a two acre urban farm on a slope in the middle of the valley in Southern California. And today we're going back to take a look at what's changed since we've been there. I'm gonna post the original blog post from 2014 in the description so you can check out all the rare fruit stuff he has growing. If you're, if you're interested in growing rare fruit, you've gotta see this video and read the blog post that goes along with it. But today we're gonna to take a look at what's happened since we were there last. So let's go. And what is this cow's name? Celandrina. Celandrina. And it's named after a soap opera star in Mexico. <laughs> uh, and that's how she came with that name. She is draining that bucket. She's absolutely draining that bucket. So she gets the whey given back to her after milking because they make cheese with this. And what kind of cheeses are you making? A whole variety, and we're going to show you them in a little later. Okay. So we'll keep that for a little later. We'll give you a whole thing on that. Fantastic. That's okay. <laughs> and the turkeys. And the turkeys. So the turkeys are hanging out with Celandrina as Celandrina eats reclaimed barley from beer making, from a beer making operation. Nothing goes to waste. And there are, are those pheasants or are those other turkeys? No, those are guinea fowl. Guinea fowl. Those are guinea fowl, the little polka dotted black and white guys walking around. From those South Africa. From South Africa. Yeah, they, 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 they come from South Africa. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, they're hanging out here in the nice, cool, shady environment. Right there. These turkeys are big turkeys, really big. And there's one here, and then there's one, I have to get through the chain link. There on top of the cage, hiding behind the pole to ruin my shot. That's fine. <laughs> That's the sound. That's the sound you want to hear. Hello, turkeys. Turkeys are aggressive, folks, so don't leave them alone. I mean, don't get in with them. Hey, and oh, hi. Sarandrina, <laughs> you're so cute. All right, bye-bye. It's sort of dark. Hey there. Hey, goats. These are alpine goats. Alpine. These are alpine goats, and they're on the roof of their, where they hang out. Hey, guys. Cute as buttons, aren't you, with your cute little goatee. Goatee, get it? <laughs> Hello, chicken. These are nesting boxes that are way up off the ground. <laughs> I don't know how this chicken gets up here, uh, but is totally hanging out in a nesting box. So cute. Kitty cats. Open the door more. Hi, kitties. Hi, kitties. No need to be afraid. Hi. Oh, they're not coming out. It's okay. You're feral, I see. You're a feral, and that's why you don't want to come out. But oh my goodness, look at you. I'm going to so step cute. away, yeah. Feral kitties who help take care of the property bro ver uh, vermin problem. Yes, they, they take care of all the mice and rats. All the mice and rats. Yay! We all need more feral cats in our lives. Thank you. So Max is milking Celandrina, the Jersey cow. The Jersey cow. Craziness. This is part of the milking barn, and we're filtering the milk through a sieve. And this, the cow's milk goes through a little filter in this um, funnel into here, and that's from one milking. Wow. So this little setup here is where the goats get milked. 
and they they uh, eat while they eat from that bucket while they're being milked here, uh, and they're they eat the uh, same good stuff. Yeah, and they're they're eating the barley that is from the beer uh, maker, the local artisan beer maker. <laughs> this is one of the goats. This so is one of the goats that were orphaned that were hand fed. This was an orphaned goat that was hand fed. Is yeah. that what you said? Wow. So this goat is. Enjoying the uh, the grains, and uh, Max is about to milk this goat. So you here. watch it. Come, watch it. Do you want to milk? Huh? Do you do you want to milk? Oh I'll my take god, that'd be ridiculous. Huh? Um, <laughs> I have if never want, milked you, a goat before, but that might be fun. Okay, I'll let you do. We'll let okay. you do it. Do you want me to take a picture of you doing it? Oh uh, well, let's just see how this goes. Now you bind the legs to just to keep them from kicking, or is it? Yeah. They don't seem to mind. They're no, just they kind don't mind it. Out. It's the regular routine. Wait, wait. And then this is the milking happening right now. And I, in my previous visit, had a glass of this goat milk, and I was really, really surprised at how not goaty it was. It was really delicious. This is going to push. Uh -huh. I'm milking a goat. Holy cow, I'm milking a goat. Oh, sorry, goat. Here we go. You're doing well. Uh -huh. Go on, squeeze hard, don't be afraid. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I got it on me. <laughs> ah, oh my gosh, this is exciting. I'm milking a goat, garden nerds. Uh -huh. This God, is, just, just, uh, I've God. never done that before. So this is actually pretty uh, pretty easy. I thought I would totally fail at this, but I am not failing at this goat milking thing. Yay! This is where the milking barn, right next to the milking barn, is this storage barn, which has two refrigerators and a freezer in it. And this is the stash of milk and some really nice looking feta also here. Dude, feta, more feta, and some more milk. It's insane, guys. Now in this other refrigerator are all these jams, and this is olive oil with tomatoes in it, uh, that they make from all the crazy rare fruits that they grow here at the little farm. We are in the quail cage, and they are so tiny little tiny quail like this and they are hanging out and we're picking up quail eggs there's a whole bunch of them in the corner and we're just hanging out in with the quail they are so tiny and cute oh my god and we're gonna pick up the eggs which are hiding kind of laying everywhere so like here's one right now Doo -doo -doo. Look how tiny these eggs are Oh my god. There's some more coming. There's some more. Two more. One, two. And these are much cleaner than my chicken's eggs. Oh, they're loud. Wow. All right. This is a red faced green cornea parrot who is hanging out in the quail cage. This is actually an Avery. And this is an Avery. With parakeet and cockatiels, quail, and a conya. Parakeets, cockatiels, oh the blue! Oh my gosh, these parakeets, hold on. So these are the parakeets. And you see them making love to each other, look, they're kissing. And they're making little see, cute they're kissing, they're kissing noises to each wife. other. Aww, so cute. And uh, yeah, super cute. So these are the boxes where the parakeets nest. There are in a few of these. And inside. Oh, the tiniest eggs of all. Wow. And those, will those become babies? These are going to be babies. These are Clive's beehives. He has eight of them total. And he has an extractor in the goat barn that uh, I did not show earlier. But Clive, how often do you harvest? 
Okay, we've had, from no, this hive. we've had no honey this year. No honey this year? And it's been quite common amongst beekeepers in this area because of the drought. Right, it they is. They don't have a natural habitat to go and forage in, mm -hmm. and that's one of the problems. Right. And so there is absolute, there's lots of brood. And there's lots of activity, but absolutely no honey. Mm. So it looks like this winter I'm going to have to feed them. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get the bee line. Because the bees are going back and forth over here. You can kind of see it. If maybe you can see it. I'll see if this turns out. But they're very active. Going back and forth. This is the vegetable garden. We've got corn that we've just picked and we're gonna eat in a minute. And then tomatoes that aren't doing so well because they got hit by the heat. But Clive plants corn in succession every three weeks so that each batch, and you'll notice these are a little shorter, each batch is a little shorter because they're three weeks behind each other. And then you end up with a nice continuous supply of corn all summer. Right, Clive? That's quite right because <laughs> I love my corn. So basically what I do, I get home in the evening, I put the water on in the kitchen, I come up over here, I pick the ears of corn, I shuck them, I give this to the animals, mm -hmm. I run back to the kitchen, I put these fresh corn kernels into the pot and I have the sweetest corn you can imagine. Now as we start getting into the rare fruit, this is a rose apple flower that is happening here. We don't have any fruit on this yet, but they're starting to flower. And uh, rose apple is it's this really weird kind of perfumey, crunchy, crispy thing that, that is hard to explain. <laughs> it, it smells like a rose and it kind of has the crunchy taste of an apple. Right, rose apple. Ding, ding, ding. This is a cherimoya and we're about to hand pollinate it. This is Clive's uh, trick for doing this. Clive, hi. Hi. Say hi. <laughs> so you have male pollen on a brush, on a little watercolor brush. And in the morning, you said that the, the flowers are, that you collect the pollen in the morning for the male flowers, and then in the, in, then you're painting on. And you put the pollen right in. Because they're too small to let a bee in. The bee can't go in there. Can't go in, all right. But in other parts of the world, they have flies that are able to get into this flower. Aha. Uh -huh. So we have to hand pollinate, and this is what we have to do on each, of, each one of them to get a full-formed cherimoya. Fantastic. And when do those end up fruiting? I mean, this is the time of year, but when will they harvest? Uh, it'll take another five months. Okay. So they'll probably harvest around December. This is a grapevine that Clive calls his wild grapevine because he planted it 25 years ago and never ever watered it or fed it or treated it or anything. And it's just dripping with fruit, if you can see these clusters of fruit that are hanging off of it. Uh, <clears throat> and this is doing so much better than the vines he cultivates on purpose down below. This is a kiwi patch that has been here, how long Clive? Uh, 15 years. 15 years, and there are little babies right here. Am I getting that? Yeah, right here, the little, these little guys. Doo -doo -doo. Clive, what is the trick for growing kiwi? Okay, this is a kiwi vine and in order to get them to produce kiwi fruit you need a male and a female. Mm -hmm. So we have one male and two females over here and for many years they were not producing much but now that they've become older and more productive they produce these big tendrils that are vine tendrils and then you have the flower and the flower has to be pollinated, obviously, male and female flowers. I think it's cross-pollination. Uh -huh. And that's how we're now getting our kiwi fruit. And I have heard, and you can probably confirm this, that kiwi fruits prefer to have their roots in shade, but vines in the sun. And you're growing them where they are kind of in that situation. And so how did you decide to plant them where they are? You know, this is news to me, and you always come with some interesting news items that I've never heard of. So serendipitously, obviously, you can see the roots are in the shade, and right. the leaves and the fruit are in the sun. Yes. So maybe that's why they're doing reasonably well this year and last year. Your instincts are good. Thanks. 
so basically what's happened, I, used, I have koi over there and we're trying to get the koi to come out. I can see some of them coming now. After the koi, I decided to build a hydroponic system and this is my design of a hydroponic system. And basically what we have here are two tanks and in the tanks, if you can get closer, you'll see lots of tilapia fish. They are black, so it's kind of hard to see. But they are there, you can see them. And what the tilapia fish do, they provide the nutrients for the new lettuce that we've just replanted because we just finished our winter crop and this is the summer crop and you can see the new lettuce that have just germinated over here. Brand new lettuces. And these lettuces are fed by the water when they develop their roots from the uh, nutrients provided by the tilapia. And at the same time, all fish need to have oxygen in the, in the water so they can survive. So the water is oxygenated by the water dripping and breaking the water surface. So there's a whole big relationship over here. This is a real ecological setup because the fish benefit by the fact that the water is broken up, they get the oxygen. The uh, ammonia and the other substances that are, no, that are detrimental to fish survival is removed by the roots of the tilapia and this um, is called Watercress. Watercress. And, and watercress. He's growing watercress and usually, usually the, um, uh, the lettuce are different varieties. They grow to this height oh. and we have fresh lettuce all the time. Nice. What so we, this is your lettuce patch. This is a lettuce patch without any bugs, without any dirt and it's pure, clean, fresh lettuce. We have this every day. The interesting thing about this is that the bees are all over this thing. So, no, you said no bugs, but the bees are really enjoying the moisture from this hydroponics operation. This is the source of the bees getting their drink and their water. It's fantastic. This is, this is their major source now. They come over here, they've got to, they've learnt that this is a source of water for them. Yeah, and they're just flying all over the place. I love it. So these are the cultivated grapevines that are on a terraced doo -doo -doo slope. These are all terraced. I mean, this whole two acre property is terraced. It's a lot of work. And then these grapevines go on down the slope for another few rows. And Clive, what grapes are you growing here? These are all table grapes. They are um, red table grapes, ruby reds. And um, what's the white one called? The famous like a, one? a Thompson? Thompson. Yes. Okay. And I see you've got passion fruit going crazy along this wall. And, and you can see some of the passion fruit has already ripened. They're doing its thing. This is the banana lane. <laughs> you walk all down this path and it's all lined with big beautiful bananas. And there are even bananas hanging that are going to be ready to harvest at some point soon. And, uh, and they're right next to... Clive's two big tanks of water and then he just added a third. So we have a total of 7,500 gallons of water that we can store. Each tank is 2,500 gallons. And you can just imagine how do you get a tank like this into this spot. That's amazing. How and did you get a tank like this into this spot? I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. This whole area is really lush. And you can't see very much of a, of a way to get that big giant tank down where it's right down below this area right here. So Clive, how the heck did you get this, uh, this, this system of water tanks down there? I'm writing my autobiography and the title of my autobiography is Persistence and Perseverance. <laughs> and that's how we did it. So briefly, this is how it is. Somebody had this tank and asked me if I wanted it and I said yes. So one of the gardeners went and collected this big uh, 2,500 gallon plastic tank and brought it into this driveway and put it over there next to the fountain. Uh -huh. I now uh, decided that the place I would like to put the tank is over there in this area. Right How over there. How does one then get the tank into this area? The conventional way is to hire a forklift company that would come in lift the tank up and take it over the trees and put it in there 
What we did, we brought the tank to this area over here, uh -huh. and then we got two guys to climb up these big trees <laughs> and string a big rope across from one tree to the other. Uh. And on the rope, we put a pulley system. Oh, what we then did, we tied ropes to the top ends of the tank, and the end of the rope from the uh, uh, tank situated in the driveway went to the back of a truck uh, in the driveway and as the truck went forwards it pulled on the rope on the pulley and lifted the tank all the way up <laughs> and I would say I would stand here and organize it and say a little bit further forward a little bit okay stop now the tank is suspended from this rope system on the pulley and now we get two guys who just push the tank over because it's on a rope system into this area. Right, because this whole the, thing is terraced, by the way. And I say to the guy driving the truck, reverse the truck, and slowly the tank comes down a little bit more, and it lands exactly where we wanted it. That's amazing. And this is, uh, this whole system, the reason why the tanks are where they are and what they do, you'll find in the blog post that is in the description below, Garden Nerds. Some of the uh, processed fruits from the little farm include grapefruit marmalade, saba, which is, is crazy. You just take all the grapes and crush them and not crush them, not just crush them. boil them and boil and, them and reduce and reduce them. And then you get this wonderful and you get this liquid called saba. I'm so looking forward to trying that. Peach compote, jujube jam, quince spread tomato sauce, kumquat jam, kai apple jelly, which is a very interesting rare fruit, blueberry jam, and of course, their honey. Da -da -da. Okay, so this is, this is milk on the kitchen stove make, to make manchego, and uh, the ingredients are here, and the instructions are very well marked up. And uh, yeah, pretty cool. This is going to be cheese in what? How many days? Or today? Today? It's going to be ready tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you like our video field trip to the little farm in the valley in Southern California. If you like this video or mittens, subscribe and share it with your friends. And uh, of course, you'll find more information on growing your own food at gardennerd.com and in my two books, Gardening for Geeks, yes, and Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden. So feel free to check those out. And of course, become a Patreon subscriber to support all the free stuff we do here at Garden Nerd. Happy gardening.